All right. So now we're going to be beginning. We're now we're going to be beginning chapter nine. In chapter nine, we start to delve into the nature of sensation and perception. It's really important to understand the difference between sensation and perception because sensation represents the information that is actually sensed from the environment. And perception is how we make sense of that sensed information and how we represent it in our brain. So the only input our brains receive from the real world is a series of action potentials passed along the neurons of our various sensory pathways. So the vast majority of stuff that we see and feel is actually constructed by our brains from these real world sensations. Nerves turn energy, such as light waves, into nerve impulses. So this is something that is understood. We know, okay, how is this light energy encoded by the brain? And the pathways that the nose, those nerve impulses take to reach the brain are also known. When we see information, when we feel information, we know the path that this information travels to the brain. But we don't know how we end up perceiving one set of nerve impulses as a representation of the world. And by this, I mean, how is it that we go from a particular set of nerve impulses surrounding the sight of a chocolate cake, for example, to the more complex mental representation of that chocolate cake? how much we desire it, um, our feelings about food, eating, is it good for us, is it bad for us? When we see things, we have a more complex representation about that information. And this more complex representation, it is what guides us in interacting with the world. But our what we sense from the world is actually much, much more simplistic. So how do we go from this simplistic sensation to this more complex perception and representation. So to give you some of the actual definitions, sensation is the registration of a physical stimuli from the environment by sensory organs. Perception, on the other hand, is subjective interpretation of sensations by the brain. When most people think of the term perception, they don't really think of its subjective nature, but our visual experience is not anything remotely close to an objective reproduction of what is quote unquote out there. Most of us have this idea that we're all seeing the same things when we look at something. If we are in a room of a crowd of people, if someone in were in our exact spot, then they would see things as we would see things. But that's not really the case. What we see is a subjective construction of reality that is manufactured by our brains. So we actually experience the world as we need to experience it. And by, me, by need to experience it, I mean we experience in a way that is defined by our own prior experiences and that based on our prior experiences, we kind of need to see the world in this particular way. And so perception really delves into biases and attitudes, preferences, attitude formation. And these are things that can have a vast impact on how we interact with the world. And so it's really important to understand how we move from sensation to perception, because in understanding that more fully, then we'll be able to understand more about uh, how people form the representations and attitudes and preferences and biases that they do and in how they form them and how they are maintained in the brain how can they be adaptively changed so here is a relatively simplistic example if we were going to try to focus on information that is more sensory in nature the information that we get from our senses is not fully complete, that it is a rough approximation, it's a representation at a basic light wave property level. 
And so to give you an example by looking at this here, you could probably tell that this is a baby, but there are certain things about it that you wouldn't be able to tell. You wouldn't be able to tell what this is, okay? Is it a pocket? Is it a big button? Is it a pacifier? So you can't really tell what this is. And you can also tell a little bit about this baby. It's wearing a hat and you can have the basics of, of skin tone. You might be think, well, maybe the eyes are sort of green or blue. It's kind of hard to tell and you have a basic idea of what it's wearing, but you wouldn't really easily be able to tell one baby from another based on this information. So your brain takes this basic sensory information and then turns it into something that is more perceptually oriented. So what we do is we extrapolate the information that comes in from our senses to build a complete construction of the world around us. And this extrapolation is based directly upon our senses but it is also influenced by our own expectations. And so based on perception, then this sort of higher level processing, we can tell that this baby has a flower right here. And we'll also be able to have the more finer nuanced perception that would enable us to distinguish this baby from other babies. So continuing on, sensation, as I mentioned before, is the registration of physical stimuli from the environment by the sensory organs. This is accomplished by specific sensory receptors that detect and convert energy from the environment into a message that is sent to your brain. These receptors basically act as encoders. They take information from the world and they encode it for our brain to use. We have sensory specific receptors that engage in very specific encoding. So our eyes encode visual information, our ears auditory information, and so on and so forth. What these sensory receptors do is they detect the energy that is in the environment, and each sensory receptor has a specific receptive field. And so we don't really think of our senses as detecting energy, but that is uh, quite actually what they do. The light waves um, is a form of energy. We have um, acoustic energy, which is a mechanical waves. Then we also have chemical energy for smell. So our receptors encode energy from the environment for our brain to process. And based on that, we perceive the world around us. So the sensory information is encoded by neurons and sent to the brain via this neural relay, which I'll be talking about later on in this chapter. This encoding is basically an action potential. So when a sensory receptor receives energy that falls into its receptive field, that causes an action potential. That action potential is the act of encoding that energy from the environment for the brain to begin to process it. The brain will then interpret the incoming sensory information into something meaningful. This is perception. Perception is the interpretation of incoming sensory information into something that is meaningful. What you perceive from the world is stuff that is meaningful to you. Each sensory system, regardless of whether it is vision, smell, or factory or touch, follows a very similar pathway of processing. So you have the incoming sensory information from the environment is right here. This is the sensation. So the energy from the environment and goes into these receptors and then it passes into the thalamic relay nuclei. And this is a fancy name for the thalamus. So we'll be talking about this a little bit more. But all sensory information, if you may recall us talking earlier, passes through the thalamus. And so the thalamic relay nuclei is the particular portion of the thalamus that the visual information passes through. And after it passes through the thalamus, it goes to the primary sensory cortex. And there are different primary sensory cortices depending upon the sensory system. So for visual information, it's in the occipital lobes. And for auditory information, it's in the temporal lobes. So we'll be talking about more of those in turn. But each sense has its own primary sensory cortex, a particular region of the brain that processes that type of sensory information. So these beginning first stages, this represents encoding and neural relay. So the information is encoded and it's relayed to the particular important part of the brain that processes it. So this here is refers to sensation, whereas the next stages 
when it moves from the primary sensory cortex to the secondary sensory cortex and the association cortex, this is where perception occurs. So to begin to continue to build on sensory receptors, you have specialized cells that transduce or convert sensory energy into neural activity. Each sensory system's receptors are designed to respond to only a narrow band of energy. So for vision, it is light energy. For auditory, it's air pressure, which refers to mechanical energy. For somatosensory, it's also mechanical energy. And taste and olfaction, it's chemical molecules. When I talk about each receptor having its own receptive field, that is the specific part of the world to which a sensory receptor organ responds. So for visual information, a receptive field could be a particular point in space. For auditory information, it could be a particular frequency. And these receptive fields allow you to sample the sensory information and locate the sensory information events in space. An important aspect of sensing information from your environment is the receptor density and sensitivity. So density is important for determining the sensitivity of a sensory system. So the more dense the receptors are, then the more finely nuanced the information you would be able to sense and then in turn perceive. So for example, your, you have a very high receptor density for touch or mechanical energy for your lips, your tongue, your fingers, but then it's much lower on your back. So you can really finely, tunely distinguish things with your fingers or with your mouth, but the touch information on your back, you if something touched your back, you wouldn't be able to tell a whole lot more about it. Whereas something, if it touched your fingers or your lips, then you get then you're able to get a lot more information about that sensory stimulus. Differences in receptor density determine the special abilities of many animals. So for example, the density of olfactory receptors for dogs is very, very high. So they have, they have an ability to smell things that we don't smell. They also have an ability to hear things that we don't hear. The same thing goes for rats. So all sorts of animals have receptors that are particularly advantageous for them. And the differences in these receptors can also determine how sensitive one part of your body is to another. And that also refers to the example that I gave between differences of how sensitive you would be to stimuli on your arm versus your fingers or your lips or something along those lines. So to give you a good example, if you're to cut your finger, even if it's a, if it's a paper cut, it, that small cut can cause a lot more pain and aggravation than a similarly sized cut on your arm. And part of that has to do with the high level of receptor density that you have in your fingertips and the much lower receptor density that you have uh, on, on your arm or your back. So all receptors connect to the cortex. So while they may be at very different parts of your body, so receptors are going to be in your eyes, your nose, your ears, and then of course you're going to have the sensation of touch all over your body. So your feet may be quite far away from your head, but all receptor information eventually will reach the brain, and that is where it will be processed to allow perception. There is no straight through point-to-point -point correspondence between one neural relay and the next. They generally all follow this pattern, however. You have the receptors here that would be whichever part of the body. They travel up to the thalamus and then again to the primary sensory cortex, to the secondary sensory cortex, and then in turn to the association cortex. And so as they travel up, they, the information becomes more and more complex. So here you're going to have very, very simple, you know, a neuron is firing, yes or no. Then it's going to pass through the thalamus. And then when it begins to be processed in the primary cortex, that's when it's going to start to pull out some real basic elements and features. And in the secondary cortex, those basic elements and features are combined. And then in the association cortex, those elements and features are further combined into more complex representations. While I am while I am primary moving up in this direction for less complex to more complex, the overall hierarchical 
the overall hierarchical organization of the sensory pathway system is not quite that simple. It looks a little bit more like this, where you have information that's coming in and it's going to the different parts of the thalamus because you're going to have multiple senses. And then you go to the primary sensory cortex where these individual senses are are processed, but these areas of the primary sensory cortex also communicate with each other. So you, to give you an example of different types of features, the visual system will detect different colors, um, it will detect edges, it will detect changes in intensity, and so those are different types of features that are each processed here, but they communicate with each other and those features are combined here in the secondary association cortices. And you can see also how there's, there is um, direct connections between uh, the thalamus and these secondary association cortices because you can have um, incoming information that can actually influence the information that is being processed. And similarly, you're going to have information that comes into these primary sensory cortex that could also influence what is going on in these higher order representations that uh, that really sets up a more a much much more complex integrative sensory processing system that gives rise to perception.